So yeah, thanks uh, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I appreciate uh, being able to to talk to you all about historical trails. It's something that has uh, been able to uh, to work on. Um, like Katie mentioned, I've uh, I've been I work at Alpine Archaeological Consultants. Um, we're based out of Montrose, Colorado, um, and I've been here for about uh, off and on through different types of uh, uh, levels of uh, as a field tech up to now a principal investigator for about 15 years. So through that, I've been able to have the opportunity to, to work on a lot of different trails with the, with the company. Um, and it's it's been something that's been really interesting to be able to to get into and to, to be able to look at because they are such an important actually kind of resource that we actually end up looking at. Um, and so tonight we're going to kind of get into that a little bit and really kind of talk about how we we have to work through uh, all sorts of different ways of, to be able to identify these routes. Um, so kind of moving on. Uh, so tonight uh, I want to look at kind of a little bit real quick about Alpine's background. Um, you know, fortunately we've we've had a, a lot of years of being able to work on trails um, with John Horn and and other folks that have worked here. Um, and so kind of talk a bit about that to understand, you know, kind of where we worked. Um, then we spend a little bit of time looking into the ways that we actually identify and then document these trails because um, they, they vary in conditions and they vary in their, uh, their histories. And based on that, we have, have to look for different types of physical characteristics and different ways to actually identify them. Um, and so through that, we're going to kind of focus on two different areas. Um, the first is going to be looking at the Santa Fe uh, National Historic Trail in south uh, eastern Colorado. And that one's different because of the way that the, the history of it presented and the amount of travel that happens and the type of travel, i.e. those are wagon roads, compared to the other uh, trail system that we'll look at and what we've recorded is the old Spanish National Historic Trail. Um, and that one was a, a pack trail, so that presented in a different way as well. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to go over this evening. Um, like I said, Alpine in the 30 some odd years as a, as a company has been actually able to document quite a number of trails over the years. Um, one of the very first projects Alpine actually worked on um, in the late 80s was actually documenting a portion of uh, the California Trail actually out in California. Um, since then, we've been able to work at, um, and look at all sorts of different uh, uh, trails, including um, kind of looking at uh, over here. Uh, this is actually a segment of the Santa Fe Trail. Um, this really nice, what looks like a canal, is actually uh, a segment of the Oregon Trail in Wyoming. Um, this down here is actually a segment of uh, the California Trail, also in Wyoming. And this one's remarkable because you can see the edges of the kind of defined areas of where the wagons had uh, worn a path. Uh, the kind of the highlight there is actually the edges of these, what we would call swale. Um, and then finally, this one here is actually a representative example of kind of later use of the old Spanish trail as a wagon road, and it's kind of built differently. And as you can see, there's a lot of different kind of characteristics and, you know, uh, ways of actually having to identify these on the ground. Um, you know, everything from big wide open swaths such as these on the California and Oregon to less filled in and less uh, defined but still identifiable to, you know, rugged terrain through the mountains and having narrower roads. Um, so here's kind of a map showing everywhere where Alpine has worked and been able to record trails or wagon roads um, throughout the western, uh, kind of intermountain west really. Um, through the years, uh, I think our, our most recent tally is uh, a little over 550 miles total uh, documented. Um, you know, everything from the Bozeman Trail up in Montana um, and in Wyoming here uh, to segments of the California, Oregon and portions of the Mormon Pioneer Trails in Wyoming and Nebraska. Um, other ones like the or Overland Trail. Um, and then obviously, you know, kind of what we're going to be looking at is the Santa Fe Trail down here in southeastern Colorado and in Kansas, in southwestern Kansas. Um, but by far, and about nearly half of about the mileage that we've looked at is on the old Spanish Trail through Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. Um, 
a good chunk of these, this work that we've done on the Old Spanish Trail has been fortunate, uh, we were fortunate to, uh, to work with the, the BLM to identify these trail routes. Um, and we've seen that, and that was back in 2010 and 2011. And since then, we've seen more and more land managing agencies uh, work to identify these trails. Um, and as such, they want to make sure that because they can be segmented, they can be hard to identify, the better that we can actually identify them previously for them, they can better manage these resources, um, especially as they you know, have to, to work. As you saw on the previous slide, there was a segment of that Oregon Trail that was underneath the transmission lines. And so we have to, you know, as if we can identify these and identify also the sites that are associated with these, the trail use, uh, it helps us protect these resources. So I chose through this tangled mass um, kind of as, a, as a, uh, a need because it is truly a tangled mat, a mass to try to figure out these, these trails. Um, it looks at times that maybe it shouldn't be that hard to find these, these old wagon roads or these old trails, but it really does take a lot of kind of detective work, if you will. Um, we do use a lot of different ways. Um, first off, archival documentation. And so that's going to be a lot of different types of maps and journals and aerial images, things uh, of that nature to be able to identify kind of just generally where the trail should be. Um, then we actually incorporate a lot of GIS analysis into it, um, whether that's some uh, kind of uh, least cost path or some modeling or a lot of imagery analysis. And then finally, all that is well and good, but really we need to get out and do the field verification um, because sometimes what we see on the ground changes and sometimes what we see in, in the air um, or from these isn't there anymore. So kind of, Mentioning, you know, the, the archival documentation, what we kind of start with is kind of the journals and the known history of where the trail should kind of go through. Um, so, for example, uh, for the Old Spanish Trail, we have a number of journals that we'll use and they can actually give a lot of good uh, descriptions of the topography and the ways in which they're, they're, uh, uh, they're traveling. Bigger areas like on uh, this GLO map or in this aerial image, these are actually of an area of um, of the Santa Fe Trail, and they were because they were on wagon, they were moving much faster. And so what ended up happening is their journal entries are not nearly as descriptive of the route, um, but because they're so much more popular, there's many more maps. And so by using these kind of a combination of these three archival documents, we can start to hone in and figure out what and where these trails are gonna be at. And like I said, we then move into kind of some GIS work. Um, this uh, uh, above image here is actually a, a what's called a least cost path analysis. Um, and so basically we take two points and say, okay, if factoring in different uh, environmental constraints, uh, vegetation, elevation, things like that, um, and, what would be the best way to walk um, or take a, a wagon? Um, and so this is actually kind of a, a representative example of a route that we identified through least cost path and then what we actually recorded. And the recorded segment is actually the yellow and red line that I'm kind of tracing right now. Um, and so you can see it, it matched pretty good up until about this point. And then you had some stuff that kind of uh, deviated, um, and that's where that kind of field verification is really important because you need to be able to say, yeah, okay, it gives us an idea, but we need to actually go find it. Um, we don't get a chance to use that tool as often based on uh, budget constraints and things like that, but it is neat, a neat aspect that we can look at. Um, really what we actually use a lot of is this imagery analysis. Um, and what happens here is that we take those uh, kind of GLOs or those maps and those historical uh, aerial images, and we can compare them to the modern uh, alignments. Um, and you can see here, uh, there's actually a, a segment of uh, the Sawatch and San Juan Toll Road, which actually was uh, overlaid the Old Spanish Trail, and it's very faint, but you can see this kind of rut, and that helps us identify where we need to go look and, and evaluate and, and identify our, our survey areas. Um, so then, like I said, 
after all of that prep work, we go out and actually look. Um, the field verification is, is one of the, the big the big parts of it. And, and to be honest, it's the fun part of the work. Um, you get to go explore lots of beautiful areas of the, of the country and uh, different types of uh, locations and kind of get a sense of what these travelers and these these individuals that were uh, walking or uh, taking the, their wagons across these this, this terrain kind of went through. Um, so kind of working through some of these images here. Uh, this is uh, an old uh, an old Alpine employee, Jack Birch. I don't know if anybody knows Jack. Um, he's now at the Army Corps of Engineers in Sacramento, but he and I did a lot of work together on the old Spanish trail. Here's him recording a, a, a Karen in some of the trail um, up near Fool's Hill on uh, north of Delta, between Delta and Grand Junction. Um, this is US 50 down below. Um, here's John Horn uh, looking at a, a segment of uh, uh, the uh, Gunnison to Sawatch uh, Road over North, uh, north Pass in the Cochitoba Hills. Um, this is my crew member back uh, in 2011, uh, Tracy. Um, we're recording a segment of the Old Spanish Trail actually out in Utah, um, and kind of what the LaSalle Mountains are in the background. And finally, here's Jack again, and this is actually in the uh, kind of the crossing the, the Prior River down in the uh, Escalante uh, Grand Staircase kind of area. Um, once again, on the Old Spanish Trail. So you can see we have a, a variety of different environments and different conditions, and in some sense, you know, the trails just don't exist. So we need to come up with a way and to accurately describe those conditions and to document those. Um, and so we've started to use, and we've been using for a number of years now, uh, the MET manual, the Mapping Immigrant Trails. It was actually produced by the Oregon and California Trails Association. And it's a fantastic resource to be able to document uh, trails because it takes into account various conditions. Um, so here's an example of a map of, uh, of a, s a segment of the Santa Fe, uh, Santa Fe National, uh, National Historic Trail. Um, it kind of shows we have uh, what we call Trail Trace, um, TTA, TTB, and then TTC. And you have kind of four different classifications of intact trail segments. Uh, your class one is perfectly intact. It's a nice trail rut or a wagon rut or a or a path through the woods, something that was, hasn't been altered. Um, a class two would be it's a verified location, but it's been overlaid by a modern two-track or got used as a, as a, a, a dirt road later on. Um, class th uh, three is it's there, but it's not there, really. Um, we don't know where, you don't have very many physical evidence of it. Um, and then finally, you have class four, which is your uh, it's verified, but it's been obliterated. A modern highway runs over on top of it or something along those lines. But you can verify the route of where it should have been. And finally, have it. we do have a class five, which is you have no idea. You don't have any kind of archival documentation. You just don't know. You don't have a very good string of where it should be. Um, so those kinds of different conditions allow us to accurately depict these trail segments throughout a, a length and then it also helps us identify areas that are being impacted. Um, <clears throat> like an example, in this map, you can see we've actually put in a lot of cattle trails and some other uh, drainages and things to help identify where erosion and impacts are happening to these trails. And, and especially on segments that are intact and interpretable, how do land agencies can then manage those intact and, and a significant kind of segments of those of these trails. Um, the, the MET manual has been a, a great aspect for us to, to utilize, um, and it really helps as you're walking through. It takes some time to, to, to recognize. Um, you have to kind of overlay and get used to like, okay, well, what's, what's the condition that I need to document here? But once you kind of get it, it creates a really nice visual representation and, and identification of these trails. So let's get into kind of some examples of how we do this work. Um, the first one we're going to look at is the Santa Fe Trail. Um, I got a picture here showing you kind of a, a real faint uh, path vegetation change. Um, what's interesting about some of these trails is even though you might not have a physical swale or a wagon rut, topographically on a very kind of small scale, it actually ends up being 
a slightly lower depression, so water pools. And so you get these areas where the grass grows greener in these trails. And so they help identify. And this is a great picture because you can kind of see the trail just kind of come out and make a slight bend. Um, and then if you look at it compared to the rest of the vegetation, the grass is a little taller in it, and, and that helps kind of identify. Um, and then the other one we're going to look at is the old Spanish trail. Um, this is actually a picture over in uh, Rabbit Valley on uh, near the west, uh, in western Colorado near the Utah border. Um, and modern modern high uh, modern gravel, uh, BLM road actually runs right on top of it, but um, it's a just a, it's a pretty picture. Um, so the reason why I chose these two is you know, we've been doing a lot of work on, on these trails, um, but I think they also represent a really good example of the different conditions that we have to look for and also how we have to use different uh, mechanisms to try to identify uh, the, the areas that we're going to look at to survey as well as document. So like I said, we'll, we'll start with uh, uh, the Santa Fe. Uh, the Santa Fe Trail is a federally designated national historic trail. Uh, that during its period of significance between 1821 and 1881 went from Franklin, Missouri uh, to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, three routes have been recognized. Um, the main route, which is there in green. Um, the mountain route, which is kind of the gold color, yellow gold. Um, and that it runs, it's kind of the northern route that runs through southeastern Colorado. Um, and then you have the Cimarron route. Uh, that goes through, uh, uh, the, that's in blue there, that goes through southwestern Kansas and then the panhandle of Oklahoma and then back into New Mexico. Um, then the, the mountain route and the Cimarron route actually join right before it goes into Santa Fe. Um, kind of some differences, you know, they, this, the, the Cimarron route was actually a shorter route for folks, um, but it was also less water, and it was, a, it was a higher likelihood of potential conflicts with various Native American groups. So they travelers had to, to make a choice. They could either then avoid that and have a better access to water by going along the mountain route, which followed the Arkansas River, but it would add time, and as well as you had to go and deal with uh, Raton Pass coming back into, uh, into New Mexico there. So we're going to kind of focus, obviously, on the southeast portion of Colorado here. Um, so during our field work, we've actually been able to have a chance to document a number of segments on this mountain route. Uh, there's actually another route, kind of a side branch that comes down this. It's the, the Barlow Sanderson Vogel Canyon route. And we did a number of segments on that one as well. Um, this all this work occurred on the Cimarron, uh, excuse me, the uh, Comanche National Grasslands. Um, and as well as we've had some times on uh, private land that we've been able to document the, the trail. Uh, so the history of the Santa Fe Trail is actually very complex, interwoven, multi uh, multicultural uh, history that really the time tonight does not allow. Um, it just celebrated its 200th anniversary last year. Um, so there was a bunch of stuff in southeastern Colorado and across the trail that celebrated this. But uh, to kind of briefly summarize its history, the trail began as a series of Native American trails that Spanish, French, Mexican, and U.S. explorers and traders utilized to traverse the Great Plains. Uh, the trail crossed through the traditional lands of many Native American groups, including the Comanche, Kiowa, Apache, Pawnee, and others. Lieutenant Zebulon Pike followed much of the route of the, mount, of the mountain routes along the Arkansas River during his exploration of the southern half of the Louisiana Purchase in 1806. Uh, the use of the route, as recognized um, officially, began in 1821, um, but the use of the route began much longer than that. Um, uh, but that was that 1821 date is kind of a, a key date, and that's because uh, trade with Santa Fe between the United States uh, at that time was relaxed with Mexican independence from Spain. Um, so the trail would be used primarily to promote commerce between the U.S., Native American groups, and Mexican nationals for over the next 20 years. Um, then with the start of the Mexican-American War um, in 1846, uh, the trail served as a military road for General um, Stephen Kearney's Army of the West, as well as the, Mor uh, the Mormon Battalion, uh, both of whom used the trail to invade Santa Fe. 
Uh, following the area's annexation by the U.S. after the war, the trail served as an immigrant trail for those individuals looking to stake their claim in the West. Eventually, the trail was also used as a stage route operated by the Barlow Sanderson Company um, between the 1860s and 1877. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad followed the route of both the mountain and Cimarron routes um, to bring the railroad through the region. The ATNSF uh, began construction in 1858 and continued well into the 1880s. And essentially, as the railroad progressed, the trail went from being used as kind of overland to just local access as the trail as the railroad made its way through the region. So given that this route was used by a lot of wagons and a lot of tra uh, uh, traders and immigrants coming across, it became this very kind of wide swath of, of wagon routes across the prairie. Um, and so they, as such, they actually covered a lot of ground a day. Um, this kind of uh, description here uh, covered about uh, Oh, I think it was something like uh, 13 miles in, in like half a day or something like that. It was a very quick moment where they're coming across. So as such, they're not leaving in their journals uh, a lot of description of what the, the, the terrain felt like or what it looked like. Um, we get a little snippets here and there. Um, but because it became such a well-known route, as I kind of mentioned earlier, these became very heavily mapped. And so we, we have a lot of good historical maps that show um, including kind of larger scale, like this is an 1894 uh, U.S. topo map of the region that shows this the, the route along the railroad. Um, but then an earlier map from the 1870, uh, this GLO shows that same route, um, but it uh, doesn't show the railroad because obviously the railroad hadn't come through yet. Um, but it kind of gives us an idea of where we should be looking for those routes. So we use those, those maps to kind of identify what kind of aerial images we need to look at. Um, so uh, I should back up real quick. Um, this point here um, is going to be actually this point in that image. So even with maps, things are a little skewed. But um, as you can see, we actually, from the modern aerial image, we can see this kind of faint line that comes down along the route. Um, so through the years that we've done this, we've noticed that we can look at a modern aerial image, see a linear feature on that aerial, and go out and look in the field, and it turns out, oh, it's, it's nothing. It's a, a modern, uh, it's, a, it's a historic, maybe um, a seismic line from, a, from, um, from oil and gas development or something that is uh, faded in, in such a way that it made it look like a historical faded route. So recently, in the last uh, five, six, seven years or so, um, we've been really using a lot of historical aer aerial images, especially as these start to become more available um, online. And that way, it helps us identify modern uses and things that are not as nearly as um, uh, historic as we want. So we can start to filter which lines that we want to look at. Um, I don't have an, ex uh, an example here on these, but uh, kind of recently I did some work up in uh, Nebraska um, identifying a, a segment of the Oregon Trail. And I was running right along the Platte River and through all the different aerial images that I was looking at, I started with like probably 20 different uh, linear features that could potentially be wagon ruts. And I was able to filter down to two or three um, by using modern aerials, but then also going all the, looking at a lot of historical aerials, um, which has been really great because that allows us to really focus in on our, on our field work. So once we kind of identify through the modern and historical aer aerial images, we can plot those and get those into our GIS to, get, to, to form our, our survey areas. Um, so kind of, to kind of highlight again, here's a couple of arrows pointing at the modern one. And then same with that kind of same trajectory of those uh, on the historical 1954 image. So here, now we have to go back out and actually look at these routes. So here we can see that we're, we're actually looking at various different types of swales. And so when I say swale, it's the 
kind of the leftover remnants of what a wagon rut would have looked like. So if you imagine like a, a two-track road in the in the in the dirt area, um, as over time that actually start to kind of fill in and kind of create a U-shaped swale or depression. And that's what we see a lot of as far as what the physical remains of these wagon roads look like. Um, they can be really hard to see. Um, so I'm going to kind of highlight kind of the edges of the swales. Um, and you can see this one's kind of wrapping itself around um, this, this, this landform over here. This one you can kind of see the extent of it. Uh, and then we occasionally will actually see, especially you can't really make it out, but this is actually a drainage crossing right here. And when we see these kinds of the route coming to these drainages or steeper terrain, you start to see a lot more braided routes and you see multiple ruts and, and swales because as the wagons start to go across, they get downcut and they get uh, uh, less traversable over time. So they just move the route over. And so it becomes this real braided mess, if you will. Um, you know, and so we can, as we start to walk and we start to record these, we can start looking at these different conditions, as I was talking about, and using different ways. Um, and then we can also actually use and help look at the, these journal entries as, as well to help kind of solidify what we're looking at. And through here, uh, Josiah Gregg, who traveled the, uh, the Santa Fe Trail, kind of wrote a, a great little snippet through here um, that kind of describes uh, the, the, the area. Um, he, he writes, and I quote, the road wound through the valley of the Tempest. The soil being impregnated with lime rendered the dust, which rose in dense columns, distressing. If anybody's then spent any time in southeastern Colorado and seen some of those dirt roads, you can just see that dust coming up and this that that kind of that state plains that we hear of of the southeast uh, and the Great Plains and of the southern Great Plains. Um, so we can use these kinds of descriptions as well as as our physical representations of these trails to really kind of understand what what these routes kind of felt like and looked like um, while they were being traversed. So the next thing we also look for is obviously artifacts. Um, I mean, that's what we all sometimes want to get into archaeology for is the, the stuff, the things. Um, but, you know, think about even today, modern roads, people throw their trash off the sides, but it's maybe not as clustered and, and centered as we want it to be. Um, so we we'll be able to find different areas. And like I was talking about these crossings, these, these drainage crossings end up being great spots because that's where a good chance a wagon might break down. Um, so they're going to do repairs at those places. So here, uh, my, my crew member, uh, Shannon, is actually doing some metal detecting. And we're looking, uh, this is actually uh, a spot in Kansas. I didn't have any pictures of uh, artifacts here in Colorado, but it kind of gives you an idea. Um, but we're seeing things like, you know, rivet heads and bolt heads. Um, cartridge casings, carriage bolts, or even hand-fashioned and, and worked metal um, that we were able to identify at these kinds of crossings. And it helps kind of narrow in. And especially, we would have segments, we'd focus some of our metal detecting on areas where the trail didn't look as solid, um, but we could then metal detect along the side. And you're able to actually see, be like, okay, no, we're on the right spot. We're actually verifying where the trail is. The rem remnants of the trail might not be there, but there are other types of evidence. Um, so then, of course, there's other sites. There's other things that are associated with these. As I mentioned, these trails are not just formed right in 1821 or, or some other time. These are long-used travel corridors by Native American groups, um, by trappers, by traders, by all sorts of people. And so we have those remnants of those other uh, occupations and, and use of this area. Um, and so in southeastern Colorado, along the, uh, the Santa Fe Trail, we were actually finding, uh, you know, stone circle sites, um, rock art panels along near uh, outcroppings. Um, and we were also getting, uh, this is a, the remnants of a stage stop along, along the Bogle uh, Canyon uh, branch. And then this is a, a, a ranch. Um, it was actually spelt uh, with an E at the end of ranch, and that actually informed travelers that there was a stop that they could, you know, along the road that they could stop and have um, uh, a meal or they can stay the night. They had amenities for travelers. Um, this is actually the, the remnants of a uh, melted adobe wall. Um, and so we have these kinds of other sites that actually intersect and or the trail comes through that are associated with it. 
Um, and as you can imagine, when we do some of this kind of work, we can get over, overwhelmed. Um, there's a lot of sites, there's a lot of things going on. So we have to sometimes pick and choose uh, what we have to focus on. Um, sometimes we get a chance to, to record all the other sites. Other times it's we're just focusing on the trail and we'll have to come back and do additional work, but we can identify where some of these other resources are at. Um, but what's nice is that it, it helps us identify and understand this continuity of travel that we see through time and the associations that multiple groups of people use these routes. So the next thing is, all right, so we've identified it. So what do we do with that information? Um, you know, the National Historic Trails, they really want them to be able to get out and have public interpretation and, and have the public be able to enjoy these resources and understand these resources. Um, they are archaeological resources, so we do have to do some kinds of protection and the location of those things have to be administered in, in the correct way. Um, but there's other options. Um, we can do things like archival documentation like these, uh, this photo here. Um, I'll actually highlight kind of where the two ruts are because um, they are hard to even see in, in black and white. Um, but then other things like uh, um, drone photography that we did some work on um, where we are able to do not as high resolution of, or high, high out satellite imagery, but you can actually get in earth and closer and you can identify additional ruts um, that aren't maybe as visible from modern aerial. You can see here's our main rut, um, but I'll kind of go over this. Another rut here, another rut down over here. And so these, these arrows are kind of pointing at that, those routes. And this kind of work helps us identify and create use of, uh, uh, documents and, and other images and things to help distribute to the public and be able to, to talk to people about what these, these trails and these, these, uh, these resources uh, look like um, and kind of the importance of what the work is out there. So let's move on to our next option, our, the Old Spanish Trail. Uh, so, the Old Spanish Trail is also a federally uh, designated National Historic Trail um, that had a period of significance of 1829 to 1849. Um, it went from uh, uh, the Santa Fe region um, to Southern California. Um, there's also three kind of main branches um, recognized. The main branch, uh, which follows this kind of line, it comes up through southwestern Colorado, up through Utah, back down into uh, Los Angeles. And you have the Armijo route, which is actually the original route that came through uh, kind of northern, northwestern New Mexico, southern, uh, northeastern uh, Arizona, comes through um, the crossing of the Fathers in this area of Lake Powell, is through this area, and then uh, comes back down and joins uh, uh, the main route. And then you have the northern branch, which kind of comes up through the San Luis Valley, across the Cochitopa Hills and through the Uncapagre Valley and Grand Valleys and rejoins the main route uh, near Green River, Utah. Um, so it was also a commercial route uh, that was used for trade between Santa Fe and um, specifically actually Abiquiu um, and the San Gab Gab Gabriel Mission in Los Angeles. Um, it also crossed through a various uh, Native American uh, groups. Um, kind of where we're focused is mostly all you historically youth country. Um, and so, again, that 1821 date kind of is a big one because that's where Mexican independence happens. And so they want to start uh, recognizing that Santa Fe is actually kind of a distant frontier of Mexico. Um, so to, in order to improve the economy, uh, weavers were imported from Cal uh, from Mexico to uh, uh, from California, excuse me, to teach the Mexicans uh, to make marketable wo woolen goods. So you have a trade of uh, wool and other goods coming from California and New Mexico back and forth. Um, unfortunately, there was some slave trade that did happen. Um, but what's important about this one is that it was all a pack trail, meaning that historically during its period of significance, it never saw any wagons. It was always a, a either horseback or mules. And so as such, the trail presented in a different fashion. And so we had to look at different ways of being able to identify it. Um, what's interesting is we're gonna look at the northern branch and specifically right here around the Cochitoba Hills region at the northwestern edge of the San Luis Valley. 
Um, the northern branch is, is odd um, in the sense that it really was never used as frequently for overland travel to California as the main route or the Armijo route. Um, it was really used to help get trappers and traders into the interior Mountain West, especially the, the Great Basin and areas of the Salt Lake area. Um, there were some groups that used it to, to access uh, California and hence why it got included as part of um, the Old Spanish Trail. Um, but it, it didn't serve as much of a overland trade, um, but it's still no, no, no less important. Um, and it's really interesting history. Um, so, to get through, as I was mentioning, the, the route never was, as it was never used for overland trail, we didn't have a whole lot of solid in period journals. Um, however, after the U.S. Uh, takes over the area, um, they start sending out all these military expeditions. And once they start doing that, we have a lot of journals that actually tell us how they're, they're, they're uh, using uh, the Old Spanish Trail. Um, the first one is that we look at is in, eight, in early 1853, uh, uh, Lieutenant Edward F. Beale is traveling to California to become an Indian, uh, one of the Indian agents. Um, but he's going along the old, uh, old Spanish Trail, but he's on horseback. Um, Gwen Harris Heap was his recorder, and he, it's the journal that we use the most frequently. Later in 1853, they start, uh, the U.S. government sends out expeditions to do um, uh, railroad surveys. And one was John, uh, Captain John W. Gunnison, and his, uh, his recorder was uh, Edward G. Beckwith. And so in 1853, we have these two accounts. What's interesting is uh, Gunnison's expedition is actually using wagons. So as they're going across the Old Spanish Trail, they're improving it for a little bit for wagon routes. However, then in 1858, uh, Colonel William W. Loring and his uh, detachment of about 300 men and roughly the same amount of horses are coming back from Utah to uh, Fort Union in Mexico, coming back from what was then called the Mormon War. Um, and he's actually, as he's traveling across the Old Spanish Trail and slash Gunnison's route, he's improving it into a formal wagon road. Um, that becomes, in Western Colorado, um, it becomes known as either the Salt Lake Wagon Road um, or the Government Road. Um, so that's where we have some good evidence of, okay, now we start having a, a wagon route that we can start looking for. Um, the routes that Beale took, he, they diverted a little bit um, because of the difference between uh, on horseback as well as wagons. Um, but we do have some evidence of some of those kinds of uh, footpaths, but they are so much less frequent to find. Um, they are very hard to find a, a footpath from the 1840s. Um, so because we do have those wagon routes, it gives us a nice jumping off spot. And then we can start looking now at what are we kind of overall uh, kind of routes that we're looking at. So once again, we can turn to our maps. Um, and there's all sorts of different maps and we're looking for things that might tell us like, oh, old Indian trail or um, old roads, things like that. Um, in 1874, Lieutenant Ruffner comes through Colorado and does uh, a survey and he actually ends up mapping both Gunnison and this is the Gunnison route coming up. It's really hard to see. It's a very, very faint line in those canyons. But then you also have more of the uh, kind of over the passes, the North and Cochetil passes. Um, then we actually see use of the trail get used later, um, especially over what is now modern Lake Cochetil Pass. Historically, it was called Carnero Pass. Um, and North Pass, it was actually historically Cochetil Pass. So there were some nomenclature issues that happened, but ultimately um, over Cochetil or Carnero Pass, you have the Sawatch and San Juan Toll Road. Um, it's labeled here on this GLO, the Sawatch uh, to Lake City Toll Road. Um, this was built by a group of investors from Lake City, um, as well as Otto Mears, if anybody's familiar with kind of the, the great Colorado road builder in the 1870s. Um, that wanted to build a supply route, a, a solid supply route from the markets in Sawatch to the, the mines in the San Juans and specifically to Lake City. 
Um, once I got to Lake City, there were some other routes that they got it ex overall extended down to Animus Forks and that kind of area um, and, and to Silverton. But then once the, the railroad came in to Silverton, the route became uh, uh, kind of uh, a less used uh, route. Um, but this road was a very solid, well-built wagon road that we have a good evidence to be able to look for. Um, and then we can also use uh, you know, more recent maps. This is an, an example of a 1905 uh, Colorado road map that shows the same routes um, that kind of show us our different areas through these different passes. So having those kinds of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, different archival maps to help look at, we can start now pinpointing where we want to uh, explore. Um, so once again, then we turn to our uh, aerial images. So this upper image is uh, actually a segment of the uh, Sawatchi San Juan Toll Road. And it's, it's a very, very faint, um, very faint road, hard to see. Um, and you can kind of highlight some arrows towards it. Um, but you can kind of see there's a couple different little ruts through there. So now we have an idea of where to look. When we get into these higher kind of uh, the, the more the, the topographic constraints, we also have to look at not only these narrow canyons and where they can actually go with the creek beds and the floodplains that we have to pay attention to, but also the vegetation. So especially on the old Spanish Trail, we know that as a on, as a footpath or a pack trail, they're unlikely to be going through heavy dense vegetation. We actually have general indications that they are trying to avoid the trees because it just takes a lot longer to have to push through. And then, of course, as Gunnison and the Noreen are building, they're talking about having to cut down trees and to, to form the actual road. And so we want to look when we're starting to identify for the old Spanish trail and these, these kinds of, you know, looking for where the footpath could actually go. Um, Look at the edges of, of the vegetation. So we can find that historic route, but then what we'll end up doing, like on this, this is actually a, a segment of um, the Gunnison to Sawatch Road. This actually went kind of over North Pass rather than um, Pochitoka, which is what the Sawatch and Sunland Toll Road went. Um, and what we'll end up doing is we'll recognize where the, his, you know, the, the wagon road is, but we know then that the footpath might be away from that. And we can start to deviate and we can start using the old um, wagon road and then to the kind of the edges of the trees um, and recognize that, you know, modernly we might have some actual trees that are growing up in the routes, but we can start identifying like they're not going to be most likely cutting down through here because that's going to be a lot of fallen dead wood and other things that are going to be hard to traverse with a, a pack animal or on foot. So, um, kind of looking at those edges of those vegetation constraints are actually a really good uh, opportunity for us. So next, let's get into, once again, what does it look like? Um, so with this, we end up seeing a lot of different types, especially through the mountains. Um, this is a segment of the Swatch and Samuel Toll Road um, right through here. This is a, a nice cut and fill road, meaning they just uh, used either shovels or later on uh, blades uh, in mechanical excavation and cut the hillside out and kind of filled in the roadbed. Um, other things where maybe the roadbed isn't necessarily as uh, defined, you'll see features of uh, like retaining walls that help define the edges of the routes. Um, other times you'll see kind of our traditional, what looks like the old Santa Fe Trail, or Santa Fe Trail you know, the, the wagon swales and the depressions. Other times, there's nothing there. We just can't see anything. It's either within a, a, a floodplain or environmental constraints, or truthfully, there's also a modern road runs right here, um, and the route could also get covered up by modern debris. Um, and so we kind of have to fight through those different elements and what all this all different uh, kind of physical characteristics of these trails. Um, and then once again, we do have artifacts. Um, so we have, you know, these 
three here uh, are kind of actually where we did some shovel uh, shovel testing and uh, metal detecting along a, a known kind of camp near camp spots along the trail. Um, and we have horseshoes and mule shoes, buckles, um, and then along the uh, the Swatch and San Juan toll road, you have you know different artifacts that related to wagon pieces. This is a, a, cha a chain link from a, some, a wagon. But then you have other elements that help kind of define the route, including uh, inscribed aspens. Um, these are some early ones. This is an 1899 date and then 1903. Um, so all these kinds of pieces start to help identify and kind of pull us into the alignment that we're looking for. Occasionally, we will find um, uh, blazes. So especially with footpaths and pack trails, they might actually blaze a tree with some kind of a marker to help identify the route. Um, but those are pretty uncommon and you kind of have to be careful because, you know, throughout time people have used these kinds of uh, aspen blazes or tree blazes. Um, and then, you know, aspens, uh, the lifespan is just not as long. So when we see ones from the 18, late 1800s, we're pretty excited. Um, even early 1900s, we're pretty excited. So once again, we also see other sites and other use, um, that continuity of travel, the continuity of use of the area. Um, along the old Spanish trail, uh, there's just lithic scatters. It feels like everywhere. Um, don't have a picture of them. They're not fun to take a picture of. They're not really easy to take a picture of. <laughs> um, but here's some nice, uh, just, you know, some mining camps. Because um, as these wagon roads got reused, um, in later time they got, you know, used to access different kinds of mines or post offices, those kinds of things. Um, this bottom image is actually the remnants of a, a, either a stage or a swing station along the Gunnison um, Swatch Road um, that probably dates to the 1880s or so. Um, and you can just barely make out the remnants of one of those last standing structures on the site. Um, so then, we talked about kind of one aspect of interpretation for the Santa Fe Trail, which was, you know, the archival documentation or the um, kind of the drone imagery. Another one is, especially on something like the old Spanish Trail, is encouraging and working with the forest potentially in the future to have walking trails to, for people to re kind of uh, be able to utilize and use the trail again. Um, and you have areas where you can have potential uh, interpretive associations and, and to be able to identify. Um, this is a, a, a depiction of, a, of a, a rock, this rock face, this formation along the trail in uh, Heap's Journal from 1853. And as we were surveying, we ended up finding the same, same rock. And uh, Heap, because of the constraints of the actual topography, they were much more kind of verbose in the language that they used to describe the trail. Um, so I'm going to kind of read a, a quote from Keith's journal that describes this area. Um, he writes in the quote, The mountainsides were clothed in fine timber, among which were pines, firs, and aspens, and the valley with the most luxuriant grasses and clover, this being the first clover we had seen. Around us were scattered numerous elkhorns and buffalo skulls. Eight miles brought us to a remarkable cliff, about 100 feet in height, with beetled uh, over the trail, uh, which beetled over the trail on our left. Nine miles above the gate, uh, gate would be what's called the Mount Buffalo Gate. Um, we saw the last water flowing east to the Atlantic. In five minutes, we are on the culminating point of the pass, which would be North Pochadoka Pass, and in 10 more, crossed this first stream flowing west to the Pacific. It was almost as if we were standing with one foot in waters, which found their way to the Gulf of Mexico and the other and those losing themselves in the Gulf of California. Really like that quote, it feels very uh, descriptive. Um, this is kind of on the, this image now kind of shows that other side of uh, looking down into those waters flowing into the, the, the Pacific or the Gulf of California. This is on the back side of uh, uh, North Pass, um, uh, no, excuse me, of Cochitoba Pass, um, kind of looking towards uh, Coach Topa Park and uh, the areas uh, west. Um, it's such a beautiful country, and you know, this these moments to be able to record and look at these trails. And this is a good example 
this is the, the wagon rut. It was real faint to see, but a lot of work went into identifying where these, these ruts are, utilizing journals, utilizing aerial imagery, um, and then the actual field work, and then the, the work to, to identify these. And now, you know, we're able to, to provide this information to both the forest um, as well as the public to be able to, to retain our information and understanding of these trails, and, and especially the use of these trails over time through uh, different Native American groups, through a more historic period, um, and that just use of the landscape. So I want to <clears throat> conclude here by acknowledging a number of individuals. Um, we did a lot. I talked a lot about uh, areas on the, uh, the forest. We've done a lot of work for the BLM as well, but this and most of the, the images and the work that we talked about tonight was all on on forest. So uh, Price Hinier and Marcy Reisner from the Rio Grande National Forest, um, as well as Jeremy Karshut, uh used to be at the Gunnison National uh, National Forest. He's now up in Alaska. Um, Dr. Michelle Stevens, who was at the Comanche and Cimarron National Grasslands. Uh, she's a forest archaeologist uh, in San Juan National Forest now. Um, a lot of thanks goes to Dr. Mark Mitchell from Paleo Cultural Research Group, uh, Research Group. He's done a lot of help. Um, we've worked closely with him on a lot of projects, and his, uh, his knowledge has been invaluable. Um, recently, we've been working with Dr. Scott Ingram at Colorado College to do some uh, identification of trails, but also help out his field schools and and help out their students. Um, and then finally, folks here at Alpine, our entire staff, but uh, especially John Horn, um, Connor John and Barb Lockwood, who've done a lot of GIS work for us on these. And then also recently, our, our crew members, Joey Stahl and Shannon Landry Dawson. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time, your attention, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, I want to open up the floor to questions. Uh, I don't think we have any in the chat box. Um, so fire away before I get going with remote sensing stuff. Okay. I've got a, a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, no, this is very interesting. Uh, I used to work at SWCA, so I'm familiar with the Met Manual and, and such. But um, I, I was wondering if have you had any experience documenting, I suppose, solely indigenous trails, and and or are there any good references out there for that? So so I'm talking about trails that might have been referred to, you know in local histories as indigenous trails that didn't, um, yeah. you know, wagon routes or something right. like that. Right. Um, you know, uh, we have, I have been fortunate to, to do one. Um, and the name of the trail is slipping my, uh, my mind right now. Um, it was actually up in the big corn country up in Montana and Northern Wyoming. And, it was a very limited, um, I mean, it was a footpath, but what was really interesting is um, you could help identify some of those because you could actually see where rocks have been kind of strewn off, kind of out of the place. But then what we really ended up finding was we had remnants of uh, teepee poles that had fallen off uh, or whatever, and then they'd actually had sagebrush grow around them. Um, and so it was it was some wild that was that was the only thing that helped us identify because it could be it looked kind of like a deer path or it looked like a game trail um mm -hmm. but you know there are certain things that we can identify that help kind of eliminate those those aspects because we know that you know a lot of game are going to probably take kind of the least path up whereas sometimes humans will say all right i could go out of my way or i can just hoof it up that hill straight up and so some of these kind of actually were like this doesn't match a contour that would make more sense and it's just going straight up the hill but then you have that we started having these these teepee poles that were were off the off the side of it and helped define the, the edge that was that was very unique um that's really the only kind of experience i've had with known indigenous trails um you know many of 
uh, of what we've dealt with is they were we, we have the documentation knowing that the, the trappers and the traders were using uh, the knowledge based on their interactions with um, uh, different Native American and ind indigenous groups um, and then they just continually reuse these these routes but those those footpaths are are few and far between that's for sure yeah I'll, I'll, I'll bet <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I guess, you know, something else that I, you know, as you were talking about the different immigrant trails, something just occurred to me in, and, you know, every so often you'll read accounts of someone going back East perhaps to, mm -hmm. to bring a group through, you know, the implication being that, you know, you would need to guide, but I assume just kind of a thought that I had is kind of referencing maybe possible ephemera, you know, did were there people who would like sell maps of routes along immigrant trails and stuff like that? And is it is, is are there still maps like that extent? Because I mean, I, I believe they must have just been the cheapest little things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there absolutely was. Um, one of the most famous is uh, um, Hastings Cutoff on the Oregon and California trails. Um, Hastings uh, was a uh, a gentleman that had actually never traveled the route, but they figured, oh, we can just go across down um, uh, into, you know, uh, uh, the, the Wasatch Mountains, just cut off and drop down into the Wasatch. And they just, they basically connected the dot and said, yeah, this is a great trail. And that's what the Donner Party followed. And that's mm -hmm. how they got. So, yeah, there are, there, there were a lot, especially on the larger kind of immigrant trails, especially. Um, there were people making kind of road guides and documents to help the uh, immigrant tra uh, immigrants come across to know where your stops are and, and where those are. Um, things like the old Spanish trail or some of the lesser, uh, I wouldn't say lesser traveled, but lesser uh, uh, formalized kind of routes in that sense, didn't have as much, they kind of relied on word of mouth uh, by people that have used the, the routes before as guides. Um, all the all the expeditions that I talked about, the, the Gunnison expedition, Beals expedition, um, Loring, they all had a, a guide, usually uh, um, Anton Guru, something like, somebody like that, that actually had walked these and, and used those. So you could, if you didn't have the, the, the guidebook, if you will, you could actually hire at you know, different forts, different places, like uh, somebody to help you get through these routes and get through these mountains and, and, and get through the, through the, the west. So. Okay, cool. And, that, and then the last question I had is about um, a lot of the imagery and, um, and, and, and perhaps also fishing for <laughs> <laughs> for sources. Uh, so I'm pretty familiar with the, uh, I think it's the Earth, the USGS Earth Explorer website. Mm -hmm. yep. um, are, are there other uh, sources out there for free imagery or is that pretty much what you use or are you using different things? No, I mean, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, depending on the area, Google, their way back machine or whatever, um, they can, they can, they posted some, um, I've seen some Google Earth images, but their resolution is just not as good when you go back on some of those. Um, the Earth Explorer is probably our go-to for sure. Okay. Um, occasionally, um, like the stuff on the Santa Fe, uh, on the grasslands, uh, the grasslands actually had their own, they had taken a lot of photos um, in the 30s and the 40s as a result of the Dust Bowl. Um, and so they wanted to see certain landscapes and, and some of that stuff. And so uh, sometimes the uh, different ma land ma managing agencies actually have, they may, might not have been, have been digitized yet or uploaded, um, but they have their own uh, aerial images. And those are usually the ones that are going to be some of the earliest ones that we can find. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I've been noticing that the Earth Explorer keeps, you know, the USGS is getting more and more of them. And we're getting earlier and earlier. Um, you know, from the 40s and stuff. So um, we also uh, have run into some issues where, you know, when we were doing some stuff around uh, up in Wyoming um, on the Oregon and California trails, uh, you know, you get these weird areas where you know that there's an airport nearby. And so they'd actually block out those areas. So they won't mm -hmm. have the 
aerial images. Um, there were some areas that we did some work on that were um, uh, Department of Defense land has always been, and we just we're not going to get those as accessible. We'll have to request those kinds of images. Um, but yeah, I mean, aside from from there, occasionally. Um, Cities and counties will have their own aerial images also uploaded um, that we kind of look at. So, uh, you know, it's uh, in Colorado, um, School of Mines has a website that shows um, aerial images, and usually they just take you to the Earth Explorer, but occasionally they have other ones. Um, and I think they actually have some that are in their library uh, mm -hmm. or in their, in their files. Um, so yeah, that's another, I mean, I'd say probably nine times out of 10 when I go to their, their website, um, they just, when you click on there, they just take you to their Earth Explorer website. So. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Katie, you can go now. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. The, the sources was one of my questions too. Um, cause back when I was at Boulder, um, we we typically scoured you know the aerial images and mm -hmm. historical maps for, for the same kind of data um i threw chris i don't know if you saw i threw a few in the in the chat that you might want to try to that we never did oh okay um anyway uh mike i was wondering have you all tried any like remote sensing type analyses like using like vegetative or moisture indices um we we like, have we have it you know we we just okay. started playing around with the the kind of least cost path, uh, path analysis kind of stuff um okay. and that we need to work on that a little bit more um but uh then you know we we we're doing some lidar work um uh kind of the stuff that i've been doing up in um on the oregon trail up in uh um uh, Nebraska that I was telling, kind of talking about like having all those different ruts that I was able to filter down. Um, we have LiDAR data um, and that mm -hmm. also helps and that helps identify even those real faint swells that you might not see on the aerial images. Um, so it's just another source, but uh, it just depends on what's kind of available. Um, and, you know, with the, some of the drone work and that was those kinds of things, we're hoping that, you know, goals down the line is we can start using some of those different techniques to help uh, identify other areas or other kinds of sites. But that's kind of some stuff that we haven't quite gotten into completely yet, so. Yeah. I mean, I would worry about the the drone imagery not being able to actually capture the variation ground surface because, right, it's just capturing that like first yeah. surface of reflectance, so. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's a lot. There is, I yeah. This goes real far down the rabbit hole, so yeah. <laughs> I don't want to bore everyone too much. Um, do you have a sense on what like the the minimum point density is you need to like actually get to those wagon ruts? I don't. I don't. Uh, okay. I, uh, I I let our, our GIS department worry about that stuff. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, okay. Sorry. Um, so they'll they'll put together those images and then I'll I'll go through and start looking at stuff. So um, sure. I don't yeah. have a, a great sense of what the what kind of I know that you know at least for the some of the lighter that we looked at for different for other projects for some other things um, those have been uh, you know the, the higher the kind of the DEM kind of the points that we're getting it really doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't help, um, but uh, we were, you know, we were able to get some pretty close ones uh, for a mining site, a pretty detailed uh, lidar, and that really brought up some old wagon ruts and stuff around with the mining town that we were looking at. So that was kind of cool. We haven't. It just depends on what's available. Um, we're kind of limited on yeah. some, but as far as the actual what we need, I we haven't done enough of it. To, I'd say that to identify our minimum. Uh, data that we need to be able to, to use it effectively. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's fair. Um, so 
I, so I have a bit of background in reco recording like historical railroad systems, okay. which focused a lot on defining junctions okay. and kind of articulating spurs and how they interconnect. Is mm -hmm. there, is there like a, some consideration of junctions when recording these historical trails? Cause it seems like it's all about segments. Yeah, and I I think that um, there there absolutely is. Um, you know, we're I think when when we talk about segments, I think it's mainly because uh, one we're, we're limited on you know probably where we can go all the time, um, so we're we're kind of just forced in that larger scheme of okay, we've only got you know two miles or something like that. Um, but, uh, we definitely see, um, uh, those moments of kind of where different routes are going and, ta uh, and, and taking off. Um, and I think it's also, you know, especially with the Met, the way that the, it documents, uh, it, it gets segmented so much because of also just the physical condition of what's left of the trails. Um, whereas, um, maybe a railroad, is going to have much more concerted effort to build a, a structure as far as the grade um, or cut down down the grade or whatever it might be. Um, there's more of a lasting impression, if you will, on the landscape where some of these are not nearly as um, evident as, as far as we go. Um, we have seen though, there are some really interesting areas um, where you do have diverging paths and where you can take those kind of junctions in those moments. Um, and those are interesting areas, definitely. Um, and some of those can actually end up being, especially on really uh, kind of the broad, you know, the, the paths through the, the prairie. And what I kind of didn't touch about here is, you know, we get these really, you know, these deeply gouged kind of ruts on Oregon and California and, and to an extent the Santa Fe Trail. Um, because everybody's kind of in one, you know, these wagon trains and these, wagon, these kind of linear kind of columns of, of travel. But then when you get into these drainages and other areas based on topography, you might actually see these kinds of splitting out. So you get these real braided routes. Um, and so you get those kinds of junctions. And then especially along like the major rivers, you start to see a lot of diverging paths and it gets really even more braided um, just depending on when people are, are traveling, what time of year and, and those kinds of things. But um, I think there is the, the segment, getting back to that kind of uh, notion, uh, to me at least it seems just because of what is left physically on the ground and sometimes you just don't have any of the, rut, the, the route left uh, or it's been broken up so much. So, um, yeah. but you know, the, and then I, I mean, I guess I don't know if also you're thinking as far as uh, junctions for railroads where you start to see, you know, kind of like sidings and stations um, where, you know, more formal interactions with people are happening. Um, and you do get that. I mean, you do see some of those, especially on, um, you know, you have uh, areas where people will stop and gather, um, but it's maybe not to the extent as a, as a railroad. So. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting perspective. Um, that that dimensionality would be really interesting. How it changes through time. Yeah, yeah. Along these routes, like going from natural landmarks, like I don't know something like Chimney Rock, Nebraska, mm -hmm. um, where it's a real like focal point of the view shed. Yeah. To more man-made features that are that are about like goods access, right. and trading, whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's where the, the journals um, really help identify because they really, for the most part, they really talk about the natural landscape much more so than um, the uh, built environments. But they, I mean, they're obviously, they're, they're talking, you know, okay, we're going from point A to point B and point A and point B are usually different ports or different way stations or something along the route. Um, but in between, they're using the, um, the, 
the natural environment to uh, to help direct. And you know, kind of coming back to Chris's question about these the guidebooks, when you look at some of those for the Oregon Trail, they they absolutely talk about like Chimney Rock or Scotts Bluff or um, Independence uh, Rock in Wyoming. These different big markers that people know where they can get to and and um, uh, without needing to worry about you know not having um, a lot of other people maybe that they're following or something. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that I like that idea of like where it can be you know fixed place and space, mm -hmm. and it's like a different environment with each period yeah. of significance that like people go through that area. Yeah, very cool. Uh, I think the dogs are about to look. So, uh, anybody else? 